This is a group, okay, good, good. This is a group that really wants to get free tonight, apparently. You are really excited to come and get free tonight. So let me talk to you for a couple minutes about the Foundations of Freedom. What we're gonna participate in over the next several hours together is something we've been doing here at Gateway Church for quite a while, and that's the Foundations of Freedom. And, and in fact, we're tying a number of the discipleship processes here at Gateway to these classes. And so I wanna talk through what it is that you can expect. One of the things that we've discovered is that people are often engaging in freedom ministry because there's something that they wish was different in their lives. And then the thing we hear from some people is when they come to the Foundations of Freedom, they, they say back to us, you didn't really talk to me about what was going on in my life. And so I wanna just introduce the idea of what's gonna happen over these next several hours together so that you can have some idea of what to expect. Here's what you can expect. There are two things that we're gonna accomplish in these hours. Now, it shouldn't take so long to accomplish two things, right? But the two things we hope to expect is we want you to focus on something different and to change the way that you think about the things you are focused on. Here's why. We want you to focus on something different because what we've learned over the last several years is this. What you seek first organizes every other aspect of your life. Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added to you. The way we've come to understand that is that we all have something that we seek first. The thing you give your attention to, the thing you give your energy to, the thing you give your time to, the thing you give your focus to, that's the thing you seek first. And whatever it is, it orders every other aspect of your life. So what happens is people who are struggling, people who are having something that they wish was different in their life, what they often do is they seek first relief from the thing they struggle with. Now what's organizing their life? See, if I struggle with depression and I seek first relief from depression, depression has just been put in charge of my life. If I struggle with rage and I seek first to control my rage, rage has just been put in control of my life. So what did Jesus tell us? Seek first what? The kingdom. The kingdom. And when we do, everything else is organized around and by the power and presence of the kingdom. So by the time we're done here, you're gonna understand that it's not a religious exercise to seek first the kingdom, but it's a powerful and present reality. And there are ways that we can engage to change what we focus on that then takes those things we wish were different in our lives and begins to make those things submit to a power greater than us and greater than the things we've struggled with. I think it's gonna be very helpful simply to learn to change the things that we focus on because when we seek first the kingdom, the power of the kingdom now has dominion over the things that you wish were different in your life. It's as if somebody was trying to fix an electronic instrument or component of some sort, and they seek first to adjust it without first seeking to plug it in. When we seek first to plug in something that's electronic, it now has a power source that makes all the switches and bells and knobs and things work. Without the power source, nothing else will work. Seek first the kingdom of God is about plugging into the power source. The second thing we wanna talk about is not just what you seek first or what you focus on, but we wanna talk about how we think about the things that we think about. That will probably be the most significant thing that you'll experience over the next two days is, listen very carefully to what the book of Proverbs says. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now here's what our mind says to us. What a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But listen again as a man thinks in his heart. See, if we try to think different things, what happens is we simply substitute one thought for another thought. And whatever we do with that thought, however it comes into our mind and however we process that thought, those things then do the same thing in us as the thing that was in us before. Did that make sense? It's like a sausage machine. Whatever you put into the sausage machine, it becomes sausage. You put beef, it becomes beef sausage. You put pork, it becomes pork sausage. You put aluminum foil, it becomes aluminum foil sausage. The way that we think shapes what happens inside of us. As a man thinks in his heart simply means this, how you perceive and what you do with what you perceive, what happens inside of you with the things that you perceive, those things shape how you are. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so the main thing that we wanna do over these two hours is we wanna to begin to change the way that you think 
Not what you think, the way that you think. If we could say it this way, we want to help people think differently. Now, here's what I want you to catch. The first thing I want you to catch about this is the freedom we've discovered. It's very helpful to, to know this before we launch into these next couple moments. Freedom has to come to us at three distinct levels, and every one of those levels matters. The first level of freedom for all of us is that we've got to have freedom from bad definitions. If we have a bad definition of freedom, all of our energy, all of our labor, all of our focus, all of how we think, if we have a bad definition of freedom, we'll labor towards it. Why? You and I are made for this thing called freedom. In the same way that we are made for food and water, and so when we're hungry and when we're thirsty, something in our soul just tugs us towards those things, we're also made for freedom. And so because of that, whatever we think freedom is, we lean into it, we press towards it, our soul's drawn towards whatever we think freedom is. So one of the enemy's first strategies is to give you and I a definition of freedom that's inaccurate. Listen carefully. Most people think of freedom from the perspective of bondage. If a prisoner thinks of freedom as the absence of bars, he's mistaken because the bars got there for a reason. If we think of freedom as the absence of something, we're already stuck. And the main reason that's true is that the Bible defines freedom very differently. See, we think freedom might be the absence of bad habits, the absence of thoughts, the absence of emotional states. If only we could change those things and get them out of our life, freedom would be the absence of something. But listen very carefully. The Bible defines freedom not as the absence of something, but as the presence of someone. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 makes it very clear that the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If what we've been doing is seeking first the absence of something, we've been focusing on the wrong thing, but we're also defining it in a way that we're straining our efforts towards getting things out of our lives instead of learning what it means to get someone into our lives. If the Bible defines it this way, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The question we need to be asking is, how far in here is he? We all understand that at the new birth, we receive the Lord into our hearts. But what about some of those corners and, and places where we haven't really allowed him in? Well, how far in he gets really is the biblical definition of freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We often think that we need to take care of things in our soul so that we come to, can come to him. But it's important that we reverse that and come to understand that when we come to him, he takes care of things in our soul. The second way that the Bible describes freedom is this. You can know the truth and the truth will, right? Now here's what we need to understand. Truth is not simply a set of facts. One of the most important things that we'll talk about in this series is an understanding of how we know things. We'll talk about this in much more detail at a later time, but here's what, you, what I want you to understand. There's what we know, and there's how we know it. The Pharisees knew the Bible very well, but how they knew it brought death both to themselves and to the people around them. There is a way of knowing that must change. Let me say it to you this way. The kind of truth that sets people free isn't when we have our facts right. It's not when our doctrine is completely, absolutely perfect. Does anyone have that yet, by the way? It's when we understand the facts and our doctrine from the perspective of God himself. Now that sounds lofty, except we need to understand that God has loaned us his senses. Second Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 2 tells us that we have the mind of Christ. And unfortunately what happens is we look at godly truth through the mind of Bob. But when we learn to have a new way of knowing and a new way of seeing, now the kind of truth that we see isn't simply new information, it's new ways of seeing the information that we've seen all along. Have you noticed the times when God gives you a revelation on something? It doesn't necessarily change the circumstances, it changes you. And the way that you understood those circumstances is changed, therefore allowing you to be free, right? 
So the two things that we're gonna focus on during these foundation classes, during these hours that we spend together is, we wanna teach you what it means to seek first the kingdom of God in a way that seems like you can accomplish it. Not a, not a vague and abstract religious exercise, but rather something that you can wake up in the morning and do. And when you do the things that we talk about, it'll bring power to your circumstance, your mind, it'll, and secondly, you'll find that the things we talk about in our time together will shift the way that you know the things you already know. It's gonna be really, really helpful. It's gonna be so helpful that you might even forget by the end of this series that you are asking for some help with something because what you got was something other than what you were asking for. Let me say one last thing before we finish this part of the, the introduction. If your parents, if you, not about your parents, if you are parents and you have children, how often does it happen that your kids ask for something that you know would not be good for them? And you give them what they need instead of what they want. And they might tug a war a little bit, they might kind of whine a little bit, they might squirm a little bit, only if they're 16 or 17 years old. But they might resist in some way because they don't want what they need in some cases. They want what they want. That describes for us the whole of the human condition. There's something about us that wants the best thing that we know to want. 99 times out of, well, 99, God will always give you what you need. And often our greatest struggle is not what God has given us, but our perspective on what we needed and our understanding of what it is that he's given us. God never leaves us stranded. God never leaves us without what we need. And yet in those seasons where we're thinking that we're not getting what we need from him, the most important thing that we can do is step back enough to say, maybe I need to think in a new way about what's already in front of me. The final thing I want to say as a way of introduction is that the things that we'll talk about in these hours together are not like taking a class in school. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that spiritual things are spiritually understood. So even our way of knowing, as we enter into this time together, as we enter, engage this material together, what you're going to find out is that you can leave this class and go, well, that was, that was all right. Or you can leave this time together and you can go, see, this is my favorite look right here. <laughs> I, I think, maybe, I may be wrong, but I think this was Jesus' favorite look as well when people go. Because what it says is, the way I was thinking about this, the way that I know things has changed. Well, the most significant change that we can make in the way that we know is moving from our carnal mind and by that, I don't just mean sinful, I mean flesh. Our human mind, understanding what it means to think with the mind of Christ. The spiritual knowing of things will help you to engage in what we do together. So we'll start up most of our sessions, if not all of them, we'll start with prayer. So what I want to do is I want to end our time of introduction with a prayer that we always pray before we enter into these foundation classes and everything else. So let's pray together. Father, Open the eyes of our hearts. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Because if you would, we could see and we could know the power, the goodness, the beauty, the greatness, the majesty, the dominion that you've given us through Jesus. And that through the things you've given us, the enemy of our souls stands beneath our feet because he stands beneath your feet. Not only that, but if we could see and know, if the eyes of our hearts would be opened, we would see the power that you've extended toward us and placed in us through your son Jesus. And we would know this thing that you call an inheritance, which is us. We're your sons and your daughters. Help us to see with the eyes of our hearts. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. Let's jump right into our first session tonight. And our first session is something that we call the Kingdom Parable. And I won't take long to introduce it because part of the way that parables work is they sneak up on you. And so what we want to do is, in with this parable, the only thing I want to say to introduce it is this is the least teaching thing that we do in this, in this setting. What we try to do is provide, if you think of a painting, we try to provide a backdrop on which the next four sessions we're going to paint on the front of that backdrop. So this is a story that will give most of the concepts that you're about to hear in the four classes that follow. But this story we call the Kingdom Parable. I like to call it the Parable of the Acrobat. And here's how you start a parable, because that's how Jesus did it. The kingdom of heaven is like an acrobat who fell off the wagon. Here's how the kingdom of heaven is like that. Once upon a time, a long time ago, and I haven't quite figured out how long ago that is, but a long time ago, there's a troop of acrobats. These acrobats traveled across the countryside, and they were known for the entire scope. In fact, outside of where they traveled, they were, they were known by, just simply by, by reputation as an amazing group of athletes who it seemed, not only could they do things that seemed superhuman, but it almost seemed as if they were in charge of gravity rather than gravity being in charge of them. They were just that good. They were strong, they were flexible, they were quick, and they had generations of, of training and capability that allowed them to do things that you and I would sit back and go, holy mackerel, how did they do that? And so when they would come to town, people would line up and they would come to the tent on the far side of town to watch this show and their jaws would just drop. Well, here's the thing you need to know about this troop of acrobats. In this troop of acrobats, there's a man and a woman the greatest male acrobat ever known to their entire troop, both historically and present day, and the greatest female lived at the same time. And as my story would go, they fell in love, got married, and conceived a child. Now think about this for a moment, if you would. The two greatest acrobats ever known to the greatest troop of acrobats ever conceive a child. Even the two of them in their quiet moments alone, much less the whole troop of acrobats, would sometimes think to themselves, what will this child be capable of? They begin to envision things that even in their own minds, they knew that this child would be capable of pushing the limits of what they had known themselves, both physically and in terms of just sheer creativity and ability to do things with gravity under him instead of over him. The imagination of them, the parents, and the troop of what could happen just began to consume the whole group. Well, it was their anticipation and excitement that made the tragedy all the more difficult. See, the tragedy was that one night, as they're traveling from one area to another, somewhere in the middle of the night, after this child was born, somewhere in the middle of the night, this child fell out of the wagon. Now, they didn't discover this until hours later. In fact, they don't know how many hours because what happened is the mother woke up in the morning and she reached for the spot in the back of the wagon where the child should have been sleeping and all she found was a blanket. And as she began to realize that the child was actually gone, of course, her heart just sinks and she screams at the top of her lungs, he's gone. And so she gets the whole wagon train to stop and people come to gather around and she says, I, I can't find him. And of course, everyone's in different states of mind. She's been searching for a while, so her heart's just been sinking. And yet others are still beginning to make plans and strategies for how we're going to find them. And someone starts to organize them, and they start to spread out over the area, and hours begin to pass. Time goes by, and as the mother's heart sinks, and the dread begins to set in, and the whole troop, the disappointment of losing this child who's been their hope, the, the emotion begins to take over the entire group. And fear and dread, anxiety, all these things begin to consume them. And no matter how long, no, how far, how wide they search, they can't find them anywhere. Fortunately, though they had no way of knowing, somewhere back along the trail, not too far behind them that night, 
a farmer and his wife had been following along behind. And though they were far enough behind that they could, didn't know the wagon train was up there, they were, they were just close enough that they found a small bundle in the, in the bushes alongside the road. They, they heard a sound, they pulled over, and they looked, and sure enough, here's a baby, and because this is a Bible-ish story, it's wrapped in swaddling clothes, right? <laughs> they pick the child up, and you know how inexperienced parents will do. They hold the child kind of looking. Well, here's what's happening. Well, miles ahead, the wagon train of acrobats is still going on yet to discover the loss of this child. They're looking, and they're immediately responding to their own reality. See, the farmer and his wife had lived together for years in, the, in a neighboring farm. And though they had tried a number of different times, they'd not been able to conceive a child. There came a point, in fact, where they both just resigned themselves to this existence together with no children. He worked the farm, she took care of the home, and they both grew kind of hard in their own way. The farmer is a man who worked the dirt, just kind of developed this sense of this is what I'm here for, I just do this, and as long as I take care of this, then everything's good. And the wife did her part, and their, their home had just become rather a cold place. He, just in his hardness, grew kind of angry at times, and she, in her hardness, was just fearful and anxious. And so what happens is, after a while of looking around themselves, they realize they can't find who this child might belong to, and it dawns on them, they're responsible. They take this baby back to their home, and they set up a room as best as they understand how, as people who've never raised a child. And, and the mother, of course, is trying with, you know, just trembling that she has this new responsibility. And the father, of course, is kind of like, great. And this is the atmosphere that the child comes into. Now, let me ask you a question. At the point that the baby acrobat fell from the wagon, was he still an acrobat? Well, before you answer, let me teach you how to answer. Do this. This will be the answer to every single question I ask you, and if I change that, I'll let you know. Why, why was it that the baby acrobat, even though he fell off the wagon and left his family behind, why was it that he's still an acrobat at that point? Because his DNA and his birthright determine who he is, not the trauma of his birth circumstances. Right? Let me ask you another question then. The farmer and his wife, they pick him up, they take him home. They've become his new parents. At the point that she lays him down in, in the crib for the first time in their house, is that baby still an acrobat? Remember? Okay. Why? Because his DNA and his birthright determine who he is, not the family that he's raised in. Are we good? All right, let's roll on. So the child grows, as children are prone to do. And the baby turns into toddler. Now, you have to keep in mind, because he is, do this, he is still an acrobat, a two-year-old acrobat is different than a two-year-old farmer. And what that means is that as he begins to get up off the ground, he doesn't just get up off the ground, he starts looking to the heights. You know, in the farmer's house, there are curtains and old wooden tables, countertops, and so the first time he drags himself up on his feet, he's not just satisfied with walking. He's looking around the room going, how far off the ground can I get? Because remember, he's designed to have gravity under him, not over him. And everything about him, every bit of his energy is directed towards trying to fulfill what's true about him as an acrobat. So when he looks up, when he looks at these things, his heart just burns inside of him. Well... What do you think this does for the farmer's wife's fear? <gasps> Get down off of there! She's filled with anxiety, and every time she catches him climbing and, and swinging on the curtains, I'm looking around to see if anyone else would approve of that anyway. Anytime she catches him defying gravity, it raises her own fear level to a point where she begins to just anything she can to stop him from being himself. And he, at age two, immediately becomes aware that if he is himself, his mother may pay a price for that. Now, the other thing is, on top of her fear, the father, 
protective of his wife as he is, looks and says, every time she's fearful, I'm going to come in and I'm going to do something about this. And so where her fear takes over, his anger comes in to try to get her fear under control, and this child is trapped in between their emotions. And at age two, he's already keenly aware that his whole environment is set against who he really is. Let me ask you a question. As that awareness dawns on him that his entire environment is set against him, fulfilling his identity, is he still an acrobat? Good. And the reason for that is because his DNA and his birthright determines who he is, not the forces set against him. So he continues to grow. And as he grows, what happens is his capability of climbing and jumping and swinging also grows with him. But his wisdom about the times to do it and the times not to also grows with him. So when he's convinced that mom is gone, he's going to try again to get off the ground and get gravity under him and him over it. There's a particular time when mom comes in and here he is, he's perched on the top of a countertop, stre stretching to get just a little bit higher. And when she walks in, she just, the blood drains from her face and she snatches him off the counter. Her husband comes in right behind, behind her and there's just this horrible moment where both of their emotions are at a crescendo and this child's just terrified and something happens inside of his little heart in that moment. He says to himself inside of his heart, I will never allow myself to try to be that person again. Very important that we hear this next question. At that moment when his heart turns, is he still an acrobat? We must hear this, that his DNA and his birthright determines who he is, not the turnings of his heart and the leanings of his soul. Age 10 comes around, and the father, the farmer who's been raising him all these years, looks at him and says, it's time to take you out in the field, boy. Well, he's just finally got the house under control where he can keep his heart at, at bay, and he's no longer tempted to swing on curtains, though it has been very costly to him to give up on his dreams. He steps outside with his father, the farmer, and he's, he's, there's trees everywhere, and there's, there's hills and rocks all around, and then there's the the barn with the rope on it, that he, he sees these things and all he can think of is his heart leaps inside of him again, this feeling that he used to have every day. In fact, this feeling that's really who he is leaps up inside of him. And as soon as he does, the farmer says, get your eyes on the ground, we've got work to do. It doesn't take long before he discovers that if he can work hard and really break up the ground and really prepare the ground for the seed, that this man is actually quite proud of him when he performs his work. And so he discovers that not only can he avoid the pain by not being himself, but he can gain approval by being someone else's version of himself. Years go by, and one day he's out there working, and he just glances up for a moment, and what he sees when he glances up is a big, tall tree the wind is blowing the branches and, and he feels that thing in his heart for a second and as he looks, his leg falls in a hole in the ground and as the plow pulls him forward, he twists his ankle. And just then the farmer looks over at him and sees that he's in an awkward position. What's going on, boy? And he gets up and tries the best as he can to pretend he's okay, but he's actually done serious damage to his ankle. And so he's just trying to go about the work that he's got to do and pretend he's not wounded. As time goes on, see there's other kids in this farming community and these other kids, as they get to know him, what they discover is he seems to them to be kind of an odd kid. And they don't quite know how to interact with this person who himself knows that he's not really where he belongs, whether he knows that or just senses that. And so what happens is, remember, he's a supercharged athlete. He's got within him the power the strength, the flexibility, the drive, more importantly, the identity to put gravity under his dominion. But he's lived his entire life underneath its control. And so what happens is this thing about him that's made to take dominion over gravity, the best he can do with it is take dominion over other boys in the neighborhood. 
and out of his frustration and out of his inability to do what he was designed for, he begins to develop a reputation as kind of an angry, violent young man. And so rather than harm or hurt other people, he withdraws and finds himself just all by himself wondering how his life has become this. Not really knowing at this point what his life was supposed to become, he just found himself wondering, how did I end up here? Just like every life-changing circumstance, the next thing that happened also snuck up on him. See, one day, as is so often the case, he's going through his normal routine, and when his parents often send him down to the local feed store, he goes down and he fills up with what he's been assigned to pick up, he pays with their money, and he carts it back home, limping back home because of his bad leg. And he's, but he's down at the feed store one day, and as he's looking across for the things that they need, suddenly his eyes fall on something that's not been there before. See, behind the counter there in the store is a poster. And on that poster is a trapeze. And on that trapeze is a man with his hands hanging onto it. And he can see by the, the image here that this man is flying through the air, hanging onto this thing hundreds of feet off the ground, and something leaps up inside of him. The acrobats are coming back to town. He doesn't know anything except what he feels. And this fire that just explodes inside of his chest sends him back home to begin what I like to call the campaign. The campaign is what most of you as parents will recognize is what happens when your child wants something and you're not sure. But he wins the campaign and finally gets his parents to agree. If you can have the farm all taken care of, if you can have all the chores done, we'll take you down to the tent at the side of town and we'll go with you to this show that you've just been begging and pleading that you want to see. And so a week goes by and he's working twice as hard and he's doing everything he can to have the farm ready. And so in that moment, the day, the, the day before the acrobats are there, he can barely sleep. He's laying in his bed just feeling that thing that he felt at the store that day. And he finally drifts off to sleep. And here's, here's the thing. That night, he has a dream. And in that dream, he sees the same thing he saw on the poster. Trapeze flying through the air. High wire. Flaming ball of death whatever that might be. But in his dream, he's not watching someone else. It's his hands on the trapeze. And it's his body that's hurtling through the air. And he's the one feeling gravity under him instead of over him. And this just set, he wakes up just a flame. He gets everything ready and gets himself dressed and still like three hours before the show. And you know, he's just, come on, we, can we go early? Finally, the time comes and they head down to the tent on the far side of town. And what happens, he sits down there, but he doesn't really sit. He, he's like right on the edge watching what's going on here. And as he watches, the show begins. And this fire that's inside of him just becomes an explosion that never stops through the entire show. Finally, the end of the show comes and he's, he's out of his chair and he's down on the floor. And he's meeting the men and the women and he's touching the trapeze and the high wire and the flaming ball of death whatever that is, and, and he's interacting with all these things, and his, his father and mother are standing back. Of course, the mom's trying not to stand back. She's wanting to stop, and the father's just kind of, you know, holding her back and just let him, let him go. And as they stand there and watch, it takes them a moment, but they realize that just off to one side, there's another couple about their age. They're dressed in the attire of acrobats, but they didn't participate in the show. And they're also watching the young man out there touching and talking and trying to climb. <clears throat> and in a moment, the acrobat, the father acrobat turns to the farmer and says to him, is that your boy? And the farmer says, well, sort of. And a conversation begins. And in that conversation, the far farmer explains the, the term sort of. What he says is this. 17 years ago, we found him on the side of the road, not far from here, wrapped in swaddling clothes, 
But as they talk, the acrobat and his wife have the strangest reaction. They're both shocked and tears begin to flow freely. And the farmer's wife, it takes them a while to understand. But as the tears flow, um, they ask him to describe the blanket that he found. And the farmer and his wife describe the blanket that the acrobat and his wife lost the same night that they lost the child. Now, it's the female acrobat's turn to want to go out there on the floor and her husband is holding her back. And as the four of them continue to talk, the acrobat and his wife begin to unfold their story of what happened to them 17 years ago. And now it's the farmer and his wife's turn to look at them in shock and tears to flow down their face because all four of them are realizing the same thing at the same time. Not only have they discovered who this child really is, all four of them are beginning to realize that something is about to change. The change begins here. The young man walks up to these four adults, all of them crying. And you know how 17-year-olds feel about that. <laughs> he walks into the middle of this strange maelstrom of emotions and he says, Mom, and he's looking at the woman who raised him. But the woman over here says, Yes. And it doesn't make sense to him for the moment. But what happens is all four of them begin to talk. And finally, the farmer speaks up and says, Son, now, it's strange because he's never really called him that before. But he says, son, you're not really who you think you are because we're not who you think we are. Of course, the child's still confused, and so the farmer takes the lead and begins to explain to him what the acrobat and his wife just began to tell him about and where they actually found him on the side, and they begin to unfold the whole story. Now it's his turn. The emotions hit him like a tidal wave as the truth of what he's hearing dawns on him. All he can do, his mind almost shifts in front of him, and it, it's, he's looking at the same thing, but it begins to look different to him. And he starts by looking to one side, and then begins to look to the acrobat and his wife. And he realizes now why the woman keeps putting her hands on him and why she keeps looking at him so strangely, and why tears keep flowing down her eyes. The two adults look at him, the four, two sets of adults, the four adults look at him, and, and there's a, a moment, a pause, a silence, and it's dawned on him now what they've already been realizing, and that is something must change, and it really falls on him as to what that change is. He could go home that day with the farmer and his wife and live the life he's always lived, or he could go home and pack and go live with the family that brought him into the world. You want to know what he decided? In that moment, he looks at the farmer and his wife and says, you know, the only life I know is the one that you've given me. And though it's not always been the life that I dreamed of, it's all that I know. And the life, he looks over here at the farmer and his wife, he says, the life you're describing to me, I can't even picture. I can't imagine what it would be like to be here every day. But something about what you're telling me, I know that I know that I know it's true. I've got to go with you, pointing at the acrobat and his wife, to discover what you're telling me is really true about me. Now listen to me carefully. Jesus, the Son of God, but also God, stepped into his own creation and walked among his children. And if we, if we don't read the story from beginning to end, we're gonna misunderstand. And here's what we've come to think. Jesus came to correct the misbehaving. No. Or we think Jesus came to straighten out the confused, or to motivate the lazy, or to educate the ignorant. And though all of those things may fit into how he did what he did, he may motivate, he may educate, he may inform, but he came to do one thing. He came to reclaim his sons and his daughters 
and offer them a chance to learn that they are not who they thought they were because our parents on earth are not the ones who thought us up and brought us into existence. The God who created the universe conceived and brought, conceived you and brought you into existence and your parents have raised you much like a farmer and his wife. And we have all lived to some degree a life that we just feel like maybe we don't fit or maybe there's something not right or maybe when those things raise up inside of us that feel so alive and suddenly the circumstances or the people or the, the relationships in our life kind of push them down as if we shouldn't be thinking and feeling those things. And Jesus comes along and he says this, I came that you might have life. Let me insert a single word. I came that you might have your life and your life abundantly. Now, oddly, when he says that, he's really saying, I came that you might have the life that I gave you in the beginning. The day that you chose to receive Jesus as Savior is exactly as the day that this young man discovered who he really was and chose to go with his real family instead of the family that had raised him. You want to know what happened? Let's fast forward in time for a second if we could. Let's pretend now that he's lived with the acrobats for a year. And I'm going to tell you something that may shock you. He stunk at being an acrobat. I know. You would think with all this fire in his soul and all these things that he's discovered about himself, you would think he'd immediately put his hands on a trapeze and he'd fly through the air with the greatest of ease, right? But you know what? He'd spent 17 years learning how to farm. He'd spent 17 years training in the ways of the earth. He'd spent 17 years under the weight of gravity. And those 17 years shaped his thinking and they shaped his perception. They shaped how he saw himself. If you'll remember, one of those particular days shaped even the sinews of his ankle. How can someone who limps be an acrobat? And so he steps into this new life and a year into it, it's not all it's really cracked up to be. He's starting to think that maybe he's not an acrobat after all. I mean, look at these kids. They're all acrobats, and they know how to do this stuff. He falls. He skins his knees. He, I mean, he just he doesn't know how to be like these kids that he's supposed to be like. He sees his parents come to practice and do things, and he's like, I, I don't think that's me. Now, there's a process that begins to happen over time. See, a year into it, he's thinking, what have I done? In fact, he may even be thinking something like this. Maybe I'm a farmer after all. Maybe I should just go back to the farm, to what I know, to what's familiar to me, and maybe I should just plow and plant. But his dad keeps saying things to him that drive him bonkers. He says things like this, son, it's time to go to practice. He says things like this, son, I love you. And when you fall, you just need to get up and try again. And again and again, the father looks him in the eyes and keeps saying those things to him. But here's what happens. The other kids are not so kind. The kids, he goes to, the kids his age and some of the older and younger ones, see, think about this for a moment. They've lived their life with this legend, this great acrobat who was lost at birth. And he shows up again and he can't even swing on a trapeze. And they're starting to resent the fact that they've grown up in the shadow of this legend and so they kind of make it hard on him. They start kind of comparing notes and saying things to each other like, who does he think he is? And, you know, being critical and harsh and mean. Even in the middle of practice sometimes, some would even shove him because they wanted to see him fail. And he'd leave the practice tent sometimes just in tears and going, I want to just go back to the farm. 
But see, the father kept looking him in the eyes and the father kept talking to him and the father kept his arms open to him. And so things would happen. Let, let me describe a couple of the things that would happen to him. He discovered a great place to hide. His favorite place to hide was there was one particular wagon in the wagon train that belonged to the troop historian. This guy kept records. Long, detailed, historical records of the entire troop, where they came from, where they've been. He kept all the, the lineage of the different families. He just he kept records. Well, this young man found that if he could just kind of sneak off to the tent and just kind of read the stories, he could escape from what was out there. So he's reading. He's discovering things like what country they came from and the name of the king that gave them their commission. He's discovering all these things about the troop, and he's, he's enjoying the fact that he's not out there with the others because it's too painful and he feels too much shame to be out there. So he just goes and reads the stories. The other thing that happens is his mom notices the limp. And see, when you're, when you're a world-class acrobat and there's no such thing as cortisone and you know, whatever else, they develop strategies for manipulating muscle and tendon and sinew to try to bring life back to things that have been damaged. And she says to him one day, she says, you know what, son? I can really help you with that. He says, what do you mean? She says, that, that ankle, I can help you with that. And he says, well, what do you mean? She says, well, here, put it up here. So he puts it up on the table and she begins to push it in a way that really, really hurts. And he, ow, you're, ow, that hurts. She says, well, I know, it's gonna hurt because it's not the way it's designed. So to get it back to where it was designed, I might have to put you through some pain. So he puts the ankle back up on the table and she pushes and he's gritting his teeth and he's just waiting. And she finally stops and says, well, there, that's enough. And he's like, and as he puts his foot down, he realizes it's got a little more flex to it. And as the day goes on, the inflammation goes down, he finds that his limp is significantly less pronounced. And she says, let's do it again next week. <laughs> he's like, what? what? But sure enough, he comes back next week and he... He puts his foot up on the table and she starts manipulating that ankle and twisting it and pushing it. He's gritting his teeth and biting his hand. And, but after all the pain, he puts his foot down on the floor again. And week after week after week, what had been a significantly pronounced and actually crippling limp disappears completely. It seems like a good thing, doesn't it? It is. <laughs> But here's the problem. He'd had many, 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 many years of thinking himself, thinking of himself as one who limps. You know what happens when you show up to practice and you're no longer one who limps? You may actually have to produce. So he gets to practice and in his mind, he can no longer say to himself, yeah, but I got this limp because he doesn't. And he discovers that more than the physical limitation was the limitation that came from seeing himself as a limping person. See, she fixed his ankle, but he had to begin to see himself in a whole new way before it could really benefit him in the practice room. So the kids are still making fun of him and he's still struggling with this and he'll run off to the, you know, run off to the historian's room and he'll start reading the stories and oh, it just kind of brings him some peace to stay out and just read the stories. Till one day, he hits a point in the story where he sees this, this woman, his mother, conceives a child. And he looks again, and he stops and he looks again, and he realizes the child she's conceived is him. See, the stories were a great escape for him until he began to see himself in the story. And he reads not only about her conception, but about the troops' hope for him and how greatly they were excited and how much they looked forward to his birth. People that he still sees in the troop are described in there as bringing gifts and, and speaking blessings over his life before he ever knew he had a life. And the more he read, instead of being able to escape, the more it drew him into fa the fact that this story included him. 
Now instead of being an escape, it was pulling him into a reality that he still wasn't quite sure he belonged in, but he was beginning to believe. The hardest part was those stinking kids. It would have worked if it wasn't for those meddling kids. <laughs> Sorry. Random Scooby-Doo reference, right? <laughs> the hardest part were the voices. He'd show up at practice. He'd even sometimes walk into the different classes. He'd hear kids make snide remarks behind him or next to him. Someone would, look him, would boldly look him right in the face and say wicked, terrible things about him. And sometimes those voices were even there when the kids weren't around because they echoed in his mind. And so he would run, days that he'd just run from the practice tent full of embarrassment and shame and just looking at himself, oh, what am I doing? And one day, he ran away. He'd fallen a third time and the kids were just merciless in the things they were saying and the ways that they were just treating him like he was nobody. So he runs off. Now remember, dad kept telling him, go to practice, go to practice, go to practice. So he can't really go back home when he runs away from practice. So he had this habit of just planting himself outside the window of the house, sitting on the ground, waiting till practice was over, and then going inside. So he sits down, but today the window was open, and he heard his mom and dad inside the kitchen. And here's what they're saying. We're so glad to have him home. If he never gets on the high wire, if he never learns to swing on the trapeze, if he never steps into those things, our hearts have been restored because our son has come home, the one who's lost has been found, and our family's complete again. And he's listening, and you ever hear something that doesn't jibe with what is in your heart, and you want it to? He's hearing this, and in his heart, he's, part of him's pushing against it, as what he's hearing, and part of him is reaching out, wanting it to be true, and they keep going. It's almost like they're kind of mushy about this thing. They just keep talking about how glad and how beautiful it is to have their son at home and how much they love. They're just talking together. He's not even in the room. And finally, he can't stand it anymore. He jumps up and he runs into the house and he grabs his dad by the collar and he says, how can this be? How can you be happy with me when I can't even swing, I can't even jump? How is it that you can love me when I can't do any of the things that the other kids do and I can't, certainly can't do what you think I'm capable of? And the father looks at him again, looks him straight in the eyes and says to him, son, I love you because you're my son. What you do has nothing to do with who I am. I'm your dad and I love you. And the son looks at him and says, but you're constantly telling me, go to practice, go to practice, go to practice, go to practice. Why do you keep sending me to practice if it doesn't matter to you? And it dawns on the father. He, he realizes the struggle inside of his son's heart and he looks at him and says, son, I, I don't want you to do that for me. I don't need you to get good at that stuff to make me happy. Here's what you need to know. There are some things hidden in your heart that you may never discover if you don't push yourself enough to find it. I send you to practice so you can find who you are, not so you can make me happy. The uh, son, just the room starts to kind of get woozy around him and he's just still trying to fit it all into his heart. And he, and he looks again at his father's eyes and he looks at his face. It's, it's like he's got a question, but... Something, instead of asking his question, he sees in his father's eyes something he has not seen until this moment. He sees himself. He sees his cheekbones. He sees his eyes. He sees the shape of his jaw in his father's face. And as he gazes into his father's face, almost like a mirror, he begins to see a reflection of who he is as he sees his own father. And it all begins to kind of hit in this deep place in his heart, so much so that he gets up and he leaves the room 
and he walks out and he starts wandering around the compound. He's just, it's all the whole, his whole way of thinking just has him almost dizzy. And as he stops, he finds himself right at the practice tent. Kids have all gone home, no one in there. And he looks in and he feels something explode in his chest. When he sees the high wire, when he sees the trapeze, when he sees those things in there, the feeling that he used to have all the time begins to raise up inside of his chest and he looks around and there's no one else and he slips inside the tent and closes the door. Starts to climb up the ladder and puts his hand on the trapeze and he begins to play. Just to have fun. He's not working. He's not striving. He's just turning loose what's in him. And instead of working to learn what he should know, he's starting to become who he is. Let's fast forward again. Now we're three months down the road. They've moved again to another location in the tents on the far side of town. And at this moment that I want you to see, the entire tent is filled. And people are looking up at the top of the tent. And what they see at the top of the tent is they see a young man standing with a blindfold on. One hand in the air, and he's listening. And a trapeze swings empty back and forth through the air. And as he listens, he hears just the right moment. He leaps up into the air and with one hand grabs the trapeze, spins around, grabs it with the other hand, does a triple flip, and swings over to the other side of the tent. And the whole tent just erupts. Even his parents are looking at him going, what the amazing. And their jaws begin to drop. And what happens is all around the tent, people's hearts are exploding. People are watching, and, and what they're seeing isn't, it's, see, it's not a tent full of acrobats that were lost and found by farmers. It's a tent full of people whose hearts have long since gone to sleep, and they're seeing somebody who's stepping into exactly who they were made to be. And they watch, and the more they see the look on his face and they see the fullness of what it is he's capable of doing, putting gravity under him instead of over him, the more they see that, they remember. And a bunch of them go home and tie ropes to trees and just start to swing. <laughs> some of them stink at it. But a process begins. But you know, some of them go home and they go back to the music lessons that used to bring so much life to them. Some of them go home and they begin to work on the things that they used to do back when their dreams were still alive. Because what they saw that day wasn't something that they needed to become. What they saw that day was someone who was becoming himself. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you that you've come back to the earth. Because had you not come back, we would have stood no chance. But because you came back and invited us back into the family, you've allowed us to become exactly who you created us to be. But Jesus, many of us have stuck our foot in a hole in the ground and twisted our ankles. Many of us have faced circumstances, whether growing up or in our environment, that bombard us with the fallenness of the world we live in. Sometimes even before we were born, the fallenness of the world falls on top of us and puts us underneath its dominion. Jesus, most of us have a hard time seeing ourselves in the story that you've written. But in this place right now, would you begin to show us, each one of us, who you've made us to be?
in this place right now. Lord, would you show us that time in our life when we were so badly broken and we began to walk with a limp. Where were you? And what lies did we believe in those moments of our life? Jesus, when we found ourselves in circumstances and relationships that pressed down on us and, and put our heart to a slow death, where were you then? And what lies did we believe because we couldn't see you in that moment? Jesus, would you speak into those moments in our life where the fallenness of our world and the kingdom of darkness were doing everything they could to steal from us the life that you made us for? Would you begin to reveal lies that we've believed? More importantly, Jesus, would you begin to speak your truth to us, in us, and through us. Thank you that you look us in the eyes and you say, I love you. I don't need you to perform. I just want you to discover who I made you to be. And from this day forward, Jesus, would you show us the kind of truth that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen.